Hello, my name is Brian Phillips. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Rehabilitation Psychology and Special Education. Today I present a webinar through Virginia Commonwealth University's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on the employment of people with physical disabilities. The particular emphasis of my presentation today will be on the improvement and use of social skills for people with physical disabilities in the labor market. In brief, to answer the question of why focus on social skills for people with physical disabilities, the answer I give is that all work is social. In today's labor market, it's almost impossible to find a job that doesn't require some amount of social skills. And most work requires, as you know, a great deal. There's a general consensus in the field of rehabilitation that social skills serve to shape employment outcomes, including the ability to get work, keep it, and to thrive and gain promotions over time. Workplace social effectiveness, this key to this outcome of employment, is a complex construct that's typically framed in an absence of more universally shared definitions by statements such as, I know it when I see it. To move this line of research forward, however, requires empirically supported means for intervention and outcome measurement. In sum, it requires us to have a better understanding of what workplace social effectiveness is and what its effect is on the labor market, and, of course, how to change workplace social effectiveness through intervention. Today I'll walk us through three projects that um, have contributed to our understanding of workplace social effectiveness. One, soft skills intervention for a college student population with physical disabilities. Two, a research study in which we looked at social capital and social role in relation to starting wage. And three, uh, some research conducted where we looked at a new model of workplace social effectiveness in the hopes of having it offer us new ways to pursue intervention and outcome research in this area. I'll conclude with a brief summary of what we've learned from these three projects and some of the implications that they have for people with physical disabilities. First, I'll talk about the soft skills intervention for college students with physical disabilities that we piloted. This study was based on a training previously created by the Office of Disability and Employment Policy. The curriculum was called Skills to Pay the Bills, Mastering Soft Skills for Workplace Success. The purpose of this training originally was to improve workplace readiness skills and was created for populations age 14 to 21, this transition age youth population that starts in high school and can use, continues through until transition points outside of high school. There are six core modules in this experiential training. One, communication. Two, positive attitude. Three, teamwork. Four, networking. Five, problem solving. And six, professionalism. In order to make this training appropriate for college students with physical disabilities, we pulled together an expert panel to review and modify wherever necessary the training and the skills to pay the bills curriculum for a college student population. This resulted in a training that stayed largely true to the original skills to pay the bills, with 90% remaining in place, but 10% uh, requiring critical changes that helped it to be more appropriate and targeted towards college students with physical disabilities. We found some unique challenges uh, in the collection of data, and particularly in the recruitment process. Nearly a dozen attempts were made to collect data with two resulting in available data. I share this because I think there's some important implications uh, to the hardship in recruitment that I'll come back to a little bit later. It's interesting to note that some attempts, even though they didn't produce empirical data that I can share with you today, created buy-in at two institutions where the Skills to Pay the Bills program continues to function at those institutions. This includes the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and at the Madison Area Technical College. Although anecdotal, those who run the programs at these two institutions have claimed that the program has produced good outcomes 
for those with physical disabilities, and it's something they intend to continue offering on their campuses. In this study, the empirical data I can share results come from a randomized controlled trial of seven intervention and seven control uh, with physical disabilities participating in the intervention. The variables we looked at most closely for this study include um, these three listed, social problem solving inventory revised, a social self-efficacy scale, and finally an expectations for employment success scale. Each of these three variables either approximated significance in their outcomes from pre-test to post-test, or in the case of social problem solving inventory, actually achieved significance despite this low number in our sample. What I share next is a figure depicting the uh, social problem solving inventory scores from time point one pre-intervention to time point two post-intervention. With a small sample size, the starting point for these two groups, intervention at the top and control at the bottom, are different, and yet the trends are what created this significant effect. You can see in the intervention group an upward trend from time point one to time point two. In the controls, not only is there um, no trend upward, there's a slight decline. This is what created a significant outcome. And when taken as a whole, this one variable that achieved significance in the intervention and the two that approximated significance, we uh, take away from this some hope that the skills to pay the bills curriculum modified for a college student uh, population with physical disabilities may be able to have a significant impact on key social constructs shown and known to help with the employment outcome. Um, implications and future directions. First, these hopeful results suggest that there's a place for an intervention with skills to pay the bills or similar programs in the college student population. That said, future research is needed in order to gain more confidence in these results. Of course, a larger sample would be very helpful to understand the robustness of these results and whether those variables that were approximating significance would become significant in the face of a larger sample. The challenge, as I mentioned, seems to exist in helping college students to perceive an importance in this type of a training. What we experienced was that those who have relatively high functioning skills, who are in a college scene already, which suggests previous success, were lacking interest in such a training that required four to eight weeks of investment in order to complete it. Research going forward might need to consider whether the same results or same outcomes could be produced with a more brief, shorter intervention, or whether some other way of approaching phys people with physical disabilities and encouraging their participation might be found that would entice participation and increase motivation to stay in the research program. Also, for this training, and as well as for any social skills training, there's a need for a continuous look at approximating real world experience. We know from previous literature that the more an intervention mirrors real world activities, in this case mirrors an employment social skills environment, the more likely the individual will be to maintain the skills learned in intervention post training. Also, there's a need in social skills intervention research to approximate real-world outcomes. These skills provide promising understanding of the benefits of the social skills training or soft skills training. Even better might be to have an employer's perception of change in social skills from time point one to time point two. Where that's not feasible, even having another source such as a VR counselor, family or friends or other individuals uh, with their perceptions of change over time would increase our confidence in the skills to pay the bills curriculum, ability to create real and meaningful change in these social and soft skills constructs. The next study I describe in this webinar focused on the relationship between social capital, social role, and starting wage for people with disabilities. As you may well know, people with disabilities experience much greater poverty rates than those without disabilities. 
And so it's important for us in the research to not only understand what factors might influence employment status, but to go beyond that, targeting directly this poverty gap, and understand what factors might influence compensation for people with disabilities as well. For a full description of this study, you can go to the Rehabilitation Counseling Bulletin with the article titled, The Influence of Social Capital and Social Role on Starting Wage for People with and Without Disabilities. This study moves us in a different direction than the previous one just described. In the first study, we were focused on how to change and improve soft skills or social skills for people with disabilities. In this study, we wanted to better understand what benefits result from possessing such soft skills or social skills that can create close relationships where social capital and social role can be shown to exist. As a little background, the study I described today is actually a replication of a previous study in which we found that social capital had both real world and statistical influence on starting wages for people with disabilities. The purpose of this study then is to extend that prior research by replicating the previous findings and adding the complementary construct of social role to understand its unique contribution to starting wage decisions. Because there's many definitions of social capital out there in the literature, I provide briefly the definition used in this study. Social capital is defined here as a person or group's level of empathy for another person or group such that whatever affects one similarly affects the other. Under this definition, social capital is often greatest among immediate family members and the closest of friends. Think of a mom's happiness at the happiness of a child, and we start to appreciate how this dependence on the other's happiness can be formed through high levels of social capital. Although not at the same level, social capital is also believed to exist in typical workplace relationships, such as those found between colleagues or even those be between an employer and an employee, an HR manager and an employee, or a supervisor and employee. The influence of social capital on financial exchanges have been demonstrated in the sale of vehicles, land, and as just described, the determination of a person's starting wage. In each case, the presence of social capital provided a financial advantage beyond that expected in an arm's length relationship or a stranger relationship in which no social capital was present. The other construct we focused on in this study was based on social role valorization theory. The genesis of applying this theory to individuals with disabilities stems from the belief that the concept of disability or occupying a disability status is devalued by society. In social role valorization theory, it's predicted that individuals' well-being and overall welfare depends on the social roles they occupy. The more valued the social roles they are perceived to occupy, the more likely they are to have an advantage in pursuing their goals and achieving their outcomes. So, it's not a far stretch to hypothesize that those holding a social role that's valued in society may actually uh, receive a higher compensation in their employment. The primary research question then in this study was whether social capital and social role serve to influence starting wage decisions. Participants were 256 students completing one of four different versions of a starting wage survey. The procedures for this study were to distribute the research packets containing one of the four research scenarios developed for this study at the beginning of class, making sure that they were equally distributed throughout the classroom. The instrument had five items, uh, measuring five different levels of relationships, namely a complete stranger, where no social capital would be expected, a close childhood friend being hired, where we'd expect that high level of social capital, someone they did not get along with, where we'd actually expect a negative level of social capital. And then the last two consider indirect uses of social capital. So the first, a complete stranger refer referred by a close friend, 
So this is a case where the stranger has no social capital, but a close friend, high in social capital of the employer, creates a little bit of a bridge. And we wanted to understand whether social capital would influence starting wage there. And then finally, very applicable in a vocation or rehabilitation setting, a complete stranger referred by a local state agency. Participants were asked to determine the maximum amount they'd be willing to pay a new bookkeeper in a small healthcare company. And again, the students answering these questions were in health fields where this would be very applicable to their decision. The four different forms of the survey were as follows. One group received a survey in which the employee was said to have no disability and no valued social role. The second form of the survey listed the person as having a general disability and no social role. The third, no disability and a valued social role. And then the fourth, this last combination where the person had a disability and also had a valued social role. So with these four forms of the survey, we collected results and then conducted a three-way mixed ANOVA with two between subject factors that was um, different across groups. This was social role and disability status and one within subject factor in which all groups shared the same questions about levels of social capital. And these were used to address the primary research question. All right, so social capital results in real terms. We found that the mean starting wage was statistically higher with higher levels of social capital across all four groups, or actually in all five levels of social capital. Pairwise comparisons showed significant differences across all levels of social capital at or near this uh, P.011 range. Uh, a friend made 79 cents more an hour than the stranger. This is that real world outcome that I was referring to previously. And a friend made $1.15 more than someone they did not get along with in these surveys. This equates to over $1,600 more per year for a friend versus a stranger. That's an amount that would not be viewed as obsolete or insignificant by those uh, that we often work with. Social role in real terms. Here again, we found statistical differences in mean starting wage for people with social roles that were valued. Results showed that a person holding a valued social role resulted in an average of 54 cents more per hour than the person without a stated social role. This again equates to over 1,000 more per year for a person working full time with a social role versus a person without. All right, in the big picture, when you take all of the different combinations, employees without disabilities actually had a higher ceiling for starting wage, with, which might be expected, but they also had a lower floor. There seemed to be a protective factor resulting from disability itself. So here that's depicted. The highest pay went to individuals who had a high level of social capital, close friend, had the valued social role. In this case, that represented, was represented by being a parent of two children and no disability. These individuals received $18.73 per hour when response were told that $17 was the average. On the lower end, this floor, this represented the group of people with low social capital, those that they did not get along with, those who had no valued social role and were listed as having no disability. These individuals came in just a titch lower than what was said to be the average pay for this bookkeeper at $16.76 per hour. When you take those two extremes, the ceiling and the floor, we talk about a difference that equates to $4,000, a little over, for people in the higher group than those in the lower group, suggesting social capital and social role have a significant effect on compensation. This figure just breaks it down in another way, showing social role in that top dotted line and someone without a valued social role in the lower solid line across the five different levels of social capital. The thing I'd point out with this is a social valued social role equated to greater starting wage across all five levels of starting wage. I find that fascinating, particularly for the person you don't get along with. 
the respondents, even if they're presented with someone they didn't get along with, created a greater compensation for those with a valued social role. Each of these different levels of relationship were significant, except for that of a close friend. In this case, that high level of social capital seemed to minimize the effect of a valued social role to a, small enough, to a large enough degree that it was no longer significant. And yet you can see in this figure that social, cap, social role always paid off, even if not significantly. All right, what do we learn and take away from this study that I've just described on what benefits may come from having or possessing the types of social skills that create relationships filled with social capital and that allow for a close or valued social roles? A valued social role is always adding to starting wage, as I just mentioned although not significantly in a close friend relationship with high social capital. It appears that social role, particularly in the absence of social capital, can have a positive effect on starting wage for people with and without disabilities. Of course, this doesn't take away from findings that we replicated that social capital or having a close relationship has a significant influence on starting wage. And that influence was shown to even exist in indirect relationships in which a state agency referred the stranger or even more so when a close friend referred a stranger to the employer. These types of relationships, both direct and indirect, appear in this study to have a direct influence on compensation for people with disabilities. Some limitations certainly exist in this study. The convenient sample limits generalizability. Use of health administration students towards hypothetical hiring decisions must be cautiously applied to actual wage determinations, which are much harder to get at in this type of a study. And then the hypothetical situations such as this cannot account for or control all of the factors relating to something as complex as wage decisions. It's possible that even wage determinations made by actual employers would vary between hypothetical survey and actual employer behavior. The third and final research project I described for this webinar today is an effort to create a new model of workplace social effectiveness for people with disabilities. For a full description, description of this research, one can go to the Rehabilitation Counseling Bulletin and search for the title a needs-driven model of workplace social effectiveness in adults with disabilities. The purpose of this new model was to provide one based on a person's capacity to meet the social emotional needs of others. Existing models focused almost exclusively on meeting one's own self-interest in social interactions. We argue here that it may be more effective to try to meet others social emotional needs in order to gain friendships, close bonds, and to be deemed as having workplace social effectiveness. The model was developed and guided by social capital theory and relational self theory. Social capital theory suggests that in every social interaction there is an exchange of social emotional goods that either increases social capital or closeness or decreases it. In relational self theory there's arguments for what are those basic social emotional needs that everyone has that need to be met in the workplace or outside of it. At the beginning of the article I just cited or referenced is a quote that we provided attributed to Carl W. Buhner and it reads, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. We liked this uh, quote because it captures what we try to do in the model. It is our assumption that meeting the social emotional needs of others may be the most salient way to develop workplace social effectiveness. So our next quest was to dive into literature and understand what are those fundamental human needs. Re relying on relational self theory, we came to the conclusion that it may best be represented in two core constructs of the need for competence and the need for communion. These two constructs have been referred to as the fundamental human needs and sometimes simply as the big two. 
Hours of effort were then spent trying to identify the social emotional goods, or what we refer to in the article as the social approach, that would be expected to influence or meet these two fundamental human needs of competence and communion. That effort led to the constructs listed in the table here in this slide. On the left, we have constructs that were found in the literature to be likely to influence perceptions of competence or the need to feel competent. And on the right, those that might influence the perception of communion or the need to feel communion in our social worlds. Under competence or the positive approach as we listed it in the article included my positive mindset, happiness, and psychological capital, which is a higher order construct capturing hope, optimism, resilience, and self-efficacy. For the communal approach, the literature suggested sincerity, empathy, reciprocity, and humility, all as possible constructs influencing this communal need. What you see here in this slide is the hypothesized model and results of a structural equation model. The model was analyzed in a two-step process, first looking at the measurement model to determine whether this table just described adequately captured two separate latent variables. And then what followed and is depicted here was a test of the structural model to understand whether the relationships between all variables were as hypothesized. I'm going to zoom in a little bit and describe what is an abbreviation soup here of what we found in our study. Starting from left to right, we have these component parts that made up the communion latent variable or the communal approach. These were empathy, sincerity, reciprocity, and humility. Each one of these were found in the factor analysis to contribute to this communal latent variable as hypothesized. Continuing across the screen, we have positive mindset, psychological capital, and happiness, also loading on the latent variable of positivity or competence as hypothesized. With this measurement model being affirmed, we were able to move into a test of the structural model. In this model, we argued and hypothesized that the communal approach and the positive approach would result in two different things. First, it would result in what you can see in the bottom left-hand side of the screen, an ability to connect with others at the workplace. In other words, increasing a person's ability to be liked in the workplace, which we found in the literature, particularly in qualitative interviews we conducted, to be a really critical component of workplace social effectiveness. We argued that this ability to connect would mediate the relationship between a communal approach and a positive approach or competent approach with our primary outcome of workplace social effectiveness. What we found in the results were that these three variables, communal approach, positive approach, and ability to connect, predicted 60%, nearly 60% of workplace social effectiveness. And through additional delta testing, we found that the ability to connect did indeed mediate the relationship both between communal approach and the positive approach on workplace social effectiveness. So in sum, it was found that this model was largely confirmed as being able to predict workplace social effectiveness for people with disabilities, thus meriting future research and study to determine how and whether this can be applied in rehabilitation counseling settings. As stated, the initial study suggests that a social approach that addresses fundamental needs of others may influence perceptions of workplace social effectiveness. Practitioners and people with disabilities alike may benefit from focusing on the extent that they meet the social emotional needs of others in the workplace, particularly on whether they meet the communal needs, often represented by warmth, as well as the competency needs, often represented by positivity in the workplace. More work is needed to further test this model in its prediction of employment outcomes, including to determine whether interventions may be created in support of this model and in support of workplace social effectiveness development for people with disabilities. In summary, 
Through the various efforts on this grant, some of which we've described in this webinar, we have learned and are still learning much about workplace social effectiveness. This includes information about what it is, what it does, and how it can be developed and managed. In the first study I described on the skills to bathe the bills intervention, we considered whether we could change and improve people's soft skills or social skills in order to improve their employment success. In the second study, we considered what benefits might result, particularly monetary benefits and starting wage for people with disabilities who possess the types of soft skills or social skills that create intimate, close relationships that are filled with social capital. In the third study, we looked more closely at what workplace social effectiveness is, what are its component parts, in order to better understand how we might move forward our intervention and our benefits on positive behaviors in the future. Increased understanding in these areas is sure to facilitate employment outcomes for people with physical disabilities into the future. This has been an, a presentation on the improvement and use of social skills in the labor market for people with physical disabilities. My name is Brian Phillips. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Department of Rehabilitation Psychology and Special Education. And this webinar has been brought to you by the Virginia Commonwealth University's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on the employment of people with physical disabilities. Thank you.